OK, um, let's keep this one a little bit interactive. Um, what I did today is listening to the presentations and then getting a few quotes out of its statements. And I'm going to drop these statements on you guys. And see, he's, all, he's already watching what the next one is. <laughs> You're even on the first slide. On the first slide. <laughs> Which means I'm not going to ask you. <laughs> so first thing I've heard uh, today that I noted was uh, Nigel saying container technology is VMware 1.0 in my brain. Um, and he's already dreaming of 2020 and 2025 uh, today. Um, however, James, at, on the other hand, says, yeah, but enterprises don't change in a big bang. It, it transitions. You cannot throw everything out and replace it with containers. Um, I want to ask either one of the other people that are not on the screen to take this one on. <laughs> There you go, Chris. So a combination of these two statements, um, looking at technologies that are coming 10 years ahead or looking at technologies that transition today, what are your thoughts on that? OK, first of all, I can't see inside Nigel's brain to answer the first question. It's OK, complex. it's far too complex. <laughs> exactly. Um, however, I can see where Nigel is thinking in the terms of um, VMware was a, was a first level of um, of consolidation, if you like, in a virtual way. Um, and containers takes us that next step forward. Now, in order to achieve that, I think we've got a bit of an issue because a lot of the stuff we need to get containers to work properly, just like when we moved away from the mainframe, is a, an application rewrite, or at least an application change, because the application needs to work differently to the way it works today. Virtualization was nice and simple because it took the concept of the server that we were already running apl applications on and lifted it up and allowed us to put it straight into something that pretty much worked fairly similarly. And obviously anybody who sat around here and done P to V of any um, workload knows it actually was a relatively simple process. Um, that's not going to be the same for, for moving to containers. It's going to be more effort. It's going to be more complex. But it will happen, and bit by bit, we'll replace applications. And obviously, that over time will happen. So I think I can see where Nigel's coming from. That makes sense in the next, you know, maybe, let's think, application refresh in the next five to 10 years. Yeah, that's what's going to happen. That's what I think that's what will happen. It'll replace. Um, Let me add on an, another question on top of that. Yeah. Do you think it's primarily going to be app refresh or new types of app workloads? Because that's something. Well, OK. <clears throat> um, everywhere I've ever worked, I don't, they, they very rarely retired an application. They usually write a replacement that does the same thing and then realize that they have to feed the data in from the old one temporarily and then the old one, the old one still stays around for a long time. So I think you'll just, you'll just end up with that continuous mess of applications and some stuff will still be on virtual environments, some stuff will still be on the mainframe, uh, you know, maybe the majority will be on containers, but you'll still have stuff everywhere. And it's only after a long, long time that they'll cut, they'll cut stuff out. Um, and I don't know what everybody else's experience is of that, but that's, that's the way I see companies doing it. Martin? I have about five, six statements. We don't have to cover them all. If you have a question to the current statements, <coughs> please do. I was just going to agree with Chris, actually. Um, there was a large retail bank at one point by, when they got to the uh, Millennium problem, they realized they were looked through their source code and found that standing orders were still running in pounds, shillings, and pence with a conversion routine <laughs> on top. So <laughs> things just don't get retired. Yeah. Um, yep. Developers die before they get retired. Yeah. So, so, like, yeah. so on, the, on the one hand, yes, statement number one, true. Number two, enterprises can't change in a big bank. Yes, which is also actually true. what you just answered. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Let me move over to. If, is there anyone that wants to ask another question on this one? Wait one second for a for mic. Give us a second. Is there anybody else in the room with a better beard? <laughs> no. I'm very jealous. Yeah. <laughs> It was kind of along the, the container stuff. Are, are we missing a big part of the container conversation, which actually it's the containers are about enabling devs to repeatedly deploy the application across environments. It's not the same use case as VMware. It, 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 I mean, is there any comments on that? Because I, I think we, we may end up in a, in a problem situation if we're using containers like VMware because I, I don't see them as, as the same use case. Having worked with a lot of devs, the excitement about containers is the dev guys talking about CI and CD and using the container to be able to have exactly the same deployment uh, environment from, from the initial incarnation of, a, of an application right through to production. I think that's a perfect one for you, Nigel. Ah. 
it's like it's ten past four, and I can't remember the first thing that you said by the end. <laughs> so, so I grabbed two questions there. I think first of all, okay. I don't personally think we'd get into a bad situation if we did use containers like virtual machines. Go check out like some of the fusion base images. You can use containers like virtual machines and run more than like let's say one process in them. Um, what was your other question about that? But you were saying it's not the same, weren't you? That it's all about. I, I don't know if this answers your question right, but I think we're moving much more towards an app-centric focus. Whereas the virtual machine was really, it was kind of application centered, but it was really operating system centered. And as IT and as businesses come to realize that applications is what it's all about, I think that containers will be that default runtime and that default packaging and um, execution environment for them. And I reckon that anything net new will go on containers, not from today, right, but in the next few years, anything net new that we develop will go on containers. And I wonder as well whether the existing applications like Oracle and Exchange and stuff like that will eventually be refactored, um, whether or not it's th the versions that we buy today as customers or if Oracle and Microsoft and people, look, you can already get Exchange as a, a cloud service, right, and um, whether that... And it's probably not running on an Exchange database. Right. right. Whether that will come down to us as customers as well, and we'll be able to deploy our own exchange on containers and things. I mean, I, I, that's probably tosh, actually. The cloud's probably a better place for that. So Waffle, let, waffle, waffle. <laughs> <laughs> let me move on to something that actually goes on that. If all of these new technologies, all that container stuff that Nigel has created courses on, Will I be running out of a job? The cloud is coming and I don't understand what's coming. I, did, I still have work to do in the enterprise, like, which I explained. I'm working with actual customers still. Um, I, we see, this comes from Steven's presentation. The cloud is coming. Take it or leave it, but it is coming. And I'm kind of, how do I need to move? How do I need to develop myself? Because there's a lot of focus you're taking, you're taking in hours of preparation or something that is coming along the road. Anyone else wants to take that? Can How I just you... say really quick, yeah. you hands will be out of a job, but all of the clever people in the room that can adapt, <laughs> they'll be just fine. This is why you need to listen to our podcast. <laughs> Please take it. I think it's a little bit of an unfair statement. I think as new technologies have come along over the years, everyone has adapted and moved on anyway. I think that the cloud is just another element to understand. I was at the AWS summit last week and I was speaking with a colleague from VCE and he is of the opinion that AWS is going to rule the world and he's going to be out of a job because he's a converged guy. Obviously the V-blocks aren't selling as well as the Nutanix is these days. <laughs> um, massively expensive ones as well. Um, but yeah, I think you know he's reskilling. He's going doing his AWS certifications. He's understanding what it takes to run an EC2 instance what I need, what the networking is there. And all the training's there for us. We're all clever guys. I think, you know, pick it up and read it. I don't think there's a fear. Mm -hmm. uh, James, you've done a couple of startups. Worked in a few. How, how do you personally, because you always, the last couple of years, you've always encountered new technologies, having to present that to people that don't understand it. How do you cope with that personally? What, presenting new technologies to people who yes. don't understand? Badly. I cope badly. I need beer. That's how I cope. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, you know, I mentioned, I, I, I'm, I, I think I'm up there in one of the longest in IT in the room. Uh, I've been here a long, long time, and there's been lots of technologies uh, and lots of variances, and it's interesting how things come around again, you know. Is it client server? Is it com, decom? Is it mainframe? Is it, you know, virtualization? Um, and cloud has been one of those things that, yeah, suddenly has come along and I think people have grasped concepts of it. Um, my experience of cloud so far personally, uh, when I'm talking to customers and talking about the various technologies that I've done over the last few years, is uh, I think one of the things that cloud enables, which is great, which sort of ties into, I guess, Certo, give them a bit of a, a plug, and an ex-employer uh, of mine is actually, for a lot of people, it gives them a very uh, simple, cheap DR. 
which they would never have done before, would have no capability for. I mean, I, I spoke to a customer once who their DR, I kid you not, was he had a USB drive that had a 45-minute fireproof rating. <laughs> and it was based on the fact that the, he was in a block and the fire station was at the other end of the block. <laughs> So he worked out that if his building burnt down, his data would be safe because it was backed up onto a 45-minute rated DR box. That was his DR. Well, now that guy, okay, that's a small organization. There's thousands and thousands of these in the country, can actually now replicate his data and actually replicate his machines potentially up into the cloud. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we're going to see uh, a lot of people take that. Large enterprises, I, I still struggle personally about putting data up in the cloud. I don't put any of my photos in the cloud. I have, no, I have zero footprint. I have a Twitter handle. Uh, I have a zero footprint. I, I personally, you were talking about encryption earlier and things like that, um, so I'm a bit of a Luddite in that sense. And I, I still struggle sometimes when I'm talking to customers, you know, going, well, are you going to move your data into the cloud? Um, and some are like, yeah, yeah, we're going to do that. And others are like, you know what? That's our crown jewels. You know, it opens it up. Enrico? Yeah, ju just a quick note about the fact that uh, cloud, yeah, is scaring. But really, how many virtual machines have you uh, switched off this year? So, and how many containers have you switched off this year or I whatever? any on. Yeah? <laughs> no, we, we are growing in, the, in quantities of any kind of resource we have on premises and also on the cloud. They have to be managed. They are managed def differently, probably, but they have to be managed. So probably we will have more to do in the next uh, future. OK. Hey, Hans, yes. we both have something to say real quick. So let me help you out here, right? Look back on your career. I look back on mine, right? I started out as a Fox Pro programmer. It doesn't exist anymore, right? Before the Microsoft days. My first introduction to infrastructure was netware. Don't even think that exists, right? We all change all the time. Tip, if you're scared of the cloud, you're in the wrong job. Go drive a taxi, go become a solicitor or something. Honestly, if you're worried about that, you are in the wrong job. Change. You know, as techies, we should love it. And if you're not, sorry, honestly, it, it's great. Chris? Or um, you could be a podcaster. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so just, just to emphasize what Nigel was saying, but in a nicer way, um, as somebody once told me that you lose 25% of your knowledge in IT every year. Um, and it always seemed like a big number, so how could you be out of date just over four years in time? And, and I think if you, look, if you look at it, Nigel just came up with two examples of technologies we don't do, and do stuff with anymore. I started off in the mainframe environment, and I don't touch any of that anymore. Enrico mentioned about Assembler and C, and I doubt he does anything on that anymore. Um, you just have to learn new stuff every single year, and you just have to keep your skills up. And, and ultimately, um, if you look at the way that the cloud's going, it isn't as easy as you think. I think it's quite a complex thing to do. If you look at some of the networking components around it, some of the complexities of how we'll manage things like moving workloads around and how we'll VPN in between the on-premises stuff and the off-premises, there's going to be an awful lot of complicated stuff that we have to learn and people have to pick up the skills. And there's lots of, that means there's going to be lots of work for Final us to do. Comment. Final comments yeah. on okay. that one? So, so I think this should be more of a, uh, kind of not the individual as such, but, the, but there are a lot of system integrators who are there in the market now. And probably they will have to change their business model because what currently they do is that they build the all, like on-site uh, clouds and stuff like that. And that will all go to a ready-made kind of a structure. So I, I'd like to... Well, you say, you say, you say ready-made, but I, how much I, of that stuff will be that easily ready-made based on what they require? So everything will be potentially bespoke around things like networking and security and, and maybe the standards they use for their stuff, that the way they configure things. So I think there's still a huge amount of work to, to make cloud stuff work for a particular customer as much as there is to make the on-premises stuff work. Okay, following up. Um, this is one that is close to my heart. Uh, I heard it first at the low dynamic session earlier this morning where they did uh, for a customer a whole test and a customer ends up, I think it was about the deduplication possibilities, and the customer ends up buying two solutions. 
And this is something that came back in my presentation where I said, well, why don't you use hyperconvergence for 80% and use best of breed solutions for everything else? I, don't, I personally don't believe in a one size fits all versus uh, best of breed. How do you manage and prepare yourself? Um, because you can't do that with the silo teams anymore, um, which, is, which is the most complaint you get from, from CIOs and so on when, when you talk about, well, just buy different solutions. Well, my team can't educate themselves on multiple solutions. Who wants to take that one? Um, I'll take that one. Um, no, I don't agree with the one size fits all either. Um, if you look back at the NetApp philosophy years ago, it was one box does everything. As we know now, that doesn't compute. Um, Martin, you said before, you know, you've got different vendors, different strategies, huge growth. I imagine there's a lot of workloads in there that are very specific to have very, very fast workloads. I think the issue comes down to manageability, is how you manage all those different GUIs, how you manage all those different APIs, and how you're getting the best out of them. Um, but I think a further complication to this is vendor management. Um, how do you ensure you are getting the best features? Um, but I think, I don't think there's an easy answer to it. I think definitely one size doesn't fit all, but there is vendors out there which are you know, perfectly suited for those workloads. Whether that's a silo, whether a actual operating system that can manage storage comes out and it is easy to use, yet to be seen. We've seen ECC, we've seen Unispheres, we've seen Sandscreens. They've all failed so far, um, but I don't think there's an answer at the moment. Is there anyone in the room that disagrees on the fact that we should have multiple solutions today versus a one-size-fits-all, or I want to focus all my energy on, on a single platform because of the ease of management. You disagree? Um, or you want to add on a conversation? You, you mentioned the right word, platform, that it, in previous years, it would have been the biggest change in your organization to move from HP servers to Dell servers. I mean, that would have just taken a vast amount of engineering. Now you could do it in a day, because you can V-motion all new machines along. You talked about platform, where as IT grows up and things start moving to the cloud and things start moving from uh, the infrastructure layer further up, wherever you are, you pick uh, the silo you're going to work above and you create your platform. If that's at a container level, if that's at a platform as a service level, if that's at a cloud level, that's where you go. And underneath that, you shouldn't to worry too much about a multi-vendor strategy. So if you've got an application that works across Google Compute Engine and Amazon, those are two vendors. But if your platform spans that, do you care? So I was going to say something real quick. Um, it depends, right, on the question. Um, if you're lazy or if your organization is lazy, or if you have a management structure that has no balls, and I apologize for the gender specific. Yeah, okay. Um, if, if, you do, if you don't take risk, then you're gonna go as much as you can towards the route of one size fits all. Because there is risk in taking best of breed solutions. And you know what? It's harder work, it takes effort. You need an organization that is gonna invest in technology and that is gonna invest in good technical people. If you're not that organization, you're in for a lot of hard work if you try and go best of breed. You're Some, for results. Yeah. Oh, oh to totally. You're not investing in technical people. You're lazy as an organization from a technology perspective, middle of the road results. It also depends on the size of the company. So if you are a very small company, you don't have many problems and you can manage with a Probably with the 80% of the hyper-convergent infrastructure, probably a small infrastructure, you can do everything. You don't, yeah. e even if you have to run a database, okay, it's not perfect, it's good enough. It depends, doesn't it? Yeah. Let me move on. In Martin's presentation, or actually it was Chris <laughs> mentioning what Martin does, is that he moved from two and a half petabytes to 50 petabytes in a matter of two years time what I want to say with this is, you were just not prepared for this. You had no idea, right? So let's, I'm, not, I'm using it as an example, the storage growth. But there's a lot of things that I don't, do not have an idea today what I will need in two years time. 
what the business will need in two years' time. How do you, or is anyone, have a solution of this is how I organize my company or how you should organize your company to, to cope with new things that I had no idea that would come, that are coming faster than I expected? That's a really, uh, uh, quite an open question, and you could, uh, I guess you could answer it lots of different ways. Um, ultimately, I think a lot of the time, I'll just say one quick answer, because I think Nigel's got something he wants to add. Um, a lot of the time, I think you need good people. You need people who understand how things are going and see the big picture, as well as you, do, you need people who can actually do things on the floor and deliver on the floor. You need people who can see that wider image of where things are going, what's good and bad. And there aren't many of those sort of people around, but you, I think you need them if you want to really be re, uh, proactive in, in the way that you uh, deploy your technology. I would just say it takes effort, right? Um, quite a few years ago now, I worked in a storage strategy team for a retail bank in the UK. Just three people in the team, right? Every Friday was set aside for future and vendors, okay? And every Friday, we'd have a different vendor would come in pre and present to us. So it took time and it took effort. And don't, don't get me wrong, we got blindsided at times, right? But we would have different vendors come in and pitch their solutions to us all the time. It was a bit of arse covering, to be perfectly honest, just in case the CIO came and said, I've played golf with such and such a vendor. What's your take on this? So that we were never like, uh. So we always had an answer. But we invested heavily in time and in people in watching the market and being on top of every solution. We've had, in Chris' presentation, and Chris said we should move it to the conversation now, because this is a nice one, where we have, where we can have active conversations about commodity or custom. Do you want to introduce it, Chris, and then maybe give it to the room? Yeah, um, and I think we, we touched on it, um, I think, in a conversation earlier today as well. Um, and, and really, we're talking about the idea of whether you could build it yourself, go and get the components off the shelf, put it all together, um, do something like Backblaze has done, where they've just taken thousands and thousands of drives, put them in a chassis. That, but you, well, they've built a the chassis themselves, but it's still reasonably commodity. Um, or whether you buy something custom from a vendor that potentially gives you some value, some value add in the choice of the selection of components. And that could be the same for a storage product. It could be a hyper-converged product where you pick the product, the pieces yourself. Um, it doesn't have to be just storage. Anyone from the audience wants to add on this? Yes, um, we have a storage my, my creator in the room. No, my, my, my opinion is that the right answer is customized commodity, really. <laughs> nice one. Can you, no, please elaborate on that for a second. Can, can you elaborate on that yeah, for a yeah, second? Sure. So, so tell me why you're saying... What, what I mean, everybody is realizing that commodity hardware is the future, right? But you can actually make it uh, work by using blueprints of customized commodity hardware. And actually, you can give people a blueprint on how to use commodity hardware in a really smart way. You know, so that's what I think it's the future. Really. Off the shelf components, but in a blueprint or uh, architecture, right? You want to add something on that, sir? Um, yeah, I, I, I kind of disagree uh, and I kind of agree at the same time as well. Uh, and I think it's, it, it's horses for courses. And yes, the commodity stuff comes in. And, uh, it, when uh, vSAN came out, I had the, the virtualization guys kind of goading me, saying, ah, oh, that's it, you guys are done. Um, everything's just going to be vSAN, and uh, we're going to take over the world, and you storage guys, you'll be nowhere. And I'm like, yeah, no. And in the same way, I'm answering that question in yes and no. Uh, and in, in, in the same argument, that it's horses for courses. But you've just got to, the, the, it, the commodity hardware and vSAN in the same way and, and any of this stuff, it's just another tool in your tool set and you make the best decision based on considered inputs into your, um, your, your use case. And... Yes, commodity it, it can be good, um, and uh, custom stuff can, can have its place too. 
Uh, and in, in the same way, when going back to, to visa and our commodity and um, the, 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 the old idea of a, a, a big EMC or whoever, three par, who, you know, who, whoever it might be, type of, of SAN environment, to say that uh, these guys are the 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 the, the um, old um, monolithic storage vendors are dead. Yes, they're dead, and no, they're not dead. So can I can I just answer your visa <laughs> question? Yes and no. So go back to the virtualization guys and say to them. What happens when it goes wrong? What happens when you have a node failure or a disk failure, or you have a controller failure or something else yeah. that you haven't catered for or designed into it, and the box decides to go into a rebuild and rebuild all that data, mm -hmm. and all the IOPS that were being used to deliver to your hosts suddenly gets diverted to rebuilding data and everything just collapses. That's yeah. what happened with some people with vSAN version one. Mm -hmm. Now version two slash six yeah, might yeah. be slightly and better than that, might be more controlled. And, 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 and that's it. Think, so, think so, the, so the, the message there is not necessarily that vSAN is bad, but mm -hmm. that we shouldn't ignore the fact that we've had 20 plus years of storage knowledge built into the products that we buy today. Yeah. And vSAN's got a long way to go to catch up to that. So it's not going to take everything overnight. It's not going to yeah. suddenly move all over to vSAN or any other product, by the way. Just, yeah. And I'm so, not just picking on vSAN. So this, um, this is a conversation we could have for hours. And Let's I, do that. I, well, <laughs> yeah. unfortunately, Enrico asked me to. Oh, uh, final, last, last final question. Yeah, so I just want to make one point. You know, coming from a, one of the bigger hardware vendors, I think what they're doing is actually commoditizing the custom build. So, you know, you have a range of different offerings. So you have a, you know, a big blade center that uh, does dense compute. And now we're seeing, you know, a range of offerings where they do dense storage, and then w what they're giving the market is that that in in, in a, some extent that customization, the freedom of choice for the customer, and actually the intelligence in the software. So you know, you choose what software to use to get the intelligence that you need, how you're going to use that hardware, and and I think it's kind of it, it, it's a bit of both, right? Thank you for that. Um, thank you, everyone. This was. A Pretty good discussion, um, which we can definitely do for almost half a day if you want to. Uh, I do want to do one more thing before before we do close the the whole event. Is a thank you from all of us for Enrico for the organization and the opportunity of this. This is the first time he's organizing a Tech Unplugged, and I think personally, I had a very nice day. I think we all agree on that. Uh, Enrico, thank you for the opportunity and the organization of this event.